Hi, and welcome to the Vintage Computer Federation YouTube channel. Your support helps us with creating videos just like this one and restoring vintage computers for all the world to enjoy. So please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. I'm kind of curious. I, I did a version of this at VCF East earlier this year. I know there are a few folks here that were at BCF East, but it uh, looks like a new crowd mostly. So this should be new material. It should be really exciting. Um, and the purpose really uh, is, is going to talk about, you know, if you're still doing development and you still want to play around with uh, Commodore hardware, then there's better ways to do it. And uh, I'll talk about one of the tools and some of the different tools that I use. So I'll be doing a lot of demos and uh, Hopefully, I don't mess up. When you're always doing a live demo, that's just inviting chaos, isn't it? So a lot, of, a lot of live demo today. So hopefully, together, we'll get through it. Um, all right. So like I said, uh, a lot of people use emulators, but some people still use the actual hardware. And that's OK. That's how it, we all kind of got started, probably, was using the original uh, hardware and working on that. Um, typing in program listings from magazines and correcting them when they wouldn't work or just giving up when they couldn't get to work at all. Um, but there's a lot better ways to do that now. So while you still want to run the programs on the legacy hardware, there's some cooler ways you can actually develop for it. So let's talk about that. But first, a bit about me. Um, I grew up in a little town called Hilton, Oklahoma. And you can see on the map, it's like really halfway between Oklahoma City and Dallas, which was pretty much nowhere. And I had saw a TI 994A, that was the first computer I actually saw. And then uh, I met my friend who was also interested in those TIs, and he had a VIC 20. And so I got to know him and his VIC 20, and I really wanted a VIC 20 for Christmas. I didn't think we could really afford a C64, so I just told my parents that I wanted a VIC-20. And then and, you know, Christmas came and there was a VIC-20 sized package under the tree and of course I opened it up and it was not a VIC-20, it was a Commodore 64. So, you know, it's not my picture but it was about like that where I kind of lost my breath and I couldn't believe that it was actually a Commodore 64. So after uh, high school, I uh, did spend uh, some time in the Army had a chance to move to Minnesota, worked for a great company called Grand Casinos Incorporated, did some interesting things there like the Stratosphere Casino, uh, bounced around to a few other companies, and uh, currently I work at uh, iSIMS. It's not ICOMS, it's uh, iSIMS is the way they pronounce that. And uh, you know, kind of like American football, they talk about coaching trees and you can kind of tell what a coach does by you know who the other coaches that they've worked with. And so this is my programming language tree for all the languages that I was either paid to use or uh, languages that I uh, learned for free. So you, a little bit about me by seeing what I've been through here. All right, so like I talked about, man, it sure is hard to see a lot of code when all you can see 40 columns and 25 rows. That was a massive 320 by 200 pixels. Not a lot, right? I remember having to keep a lot of notes. I had to have notebooks where I had remembered, uh, oh, here's all the line numbers for different go subs, and here's all the different pokes I wanted to remember, and here's all the go-tos, and so I had to keep all this paper just so I could keep track, because you can't do much when you're just looking at that little bit of code. It's also one color. Hard to imagine that uh, we came so far from there. I mean, now, you got this like these ridiculous amounts of screen space. You can see so much code now. And all the color and syntax highlighting, things like that. You know, I uh, actually asked a lot of the software engineers that I work with, like how much code they usually see, how, how, what the font size they use. And uh, some of them have like unbelievable uh, small fonts, but my eyes are not quite that young. So I usually stick around 60 rows. That's uh, still significantly more than we'd be talking about on a small 64. 
So I'm gonna talk a lot about the other things that we've got and why we wanna use uh, CBM PRG Studio, but I think the size is like the number one issue for me. It's right there, I should convince you. Talk's over, no, I'm kidding. All right, so some of the tools we're gonna to use today. I'm gonna to be using the Vice Emulator. Hopefully everybody has, has some familiarity with that. I'm gonna be using the CBM PRG Studio. Uh, mostly the Beta 13, version four is coming, but it's not out yet. I also want to talk about a tool that I use quite a bit, which is this uh, Duramaster tool. Very handy if you use anything where you're trying to move things between original hardware and uh, a modern PC, you probably need to use some version of this. So I guess let's take a quick tour. So uh, let me see if I can get out of this and uh, jump into a few things here. All right, first of all, I was, uh, I was lucky enough to extract all of the uh, old floppy disks I had at some point. And so I extract them all into these D64 files. And you're probably hopefully familiar with that D64 format. This Duramaster tool has a wonderful way of not only can I get in here and I can see all the things here, you can also see like all the old scratch files, which is really cool because I extracted this disk and then I like realized, oh wait, there's a bunch of other stuff that I actually worked on different times and I deleted off this disk and it's actually still there. It gives you some cool ways to view that. You can actually take PRG files and it will give you a nice little display of them there, kind of handy. And you can also create brand new ones, and it's as easy to move things between them as dragging and dropping. Now one of the other cool things here is, I think if you've seen some of the new D64 files, they all come with like fancy separators and stuff like that. So you can uh, rearrange the order here, and you can also insert those cool separators and make your listings all neat like that. So that's some kind of cool stuff. But let's talk about what else I use this for. So I was talking, I showed you this program Thief here. This is a program, I wrote it quite a while ago. It has quite a few spelling errors too. Uh, growing up in Hilton, I didn't learn to spell very well at the time. Um, but you can attach an emulator here and I have an emulator attached so I can actually run program right from the Duramaster into Vice. Very handy. Anyway, so this program was, uh, actually it was something I saw on the TI first, where you're trying to uh, guess the combination of the safe and uh, open it before the, the cops come and bust you. So let me see if I can do it real quick here without getting busted. And yeah, I got all three digits. So anyway. I say combination. I don't know how to spell combination at the time. But anyway, so this is a little program. It's kind of cool. I say that I took this from a floppy disk that I had from the 1980s and copied it over to a D64 file. And uh, now I can run it in an emulator today, which is kind of cool and kind of scary looking at things that I wrote in 1984. Uh, all right, so I should get busted by the cops here any second. There we go. So anyway, that's the program. But what I want to really show is now, I'm going to go real quick and take something through this. We're, we'll spend the rest of the time going into the, the features a bit more in depth, but I first wanted to show uh, how to do something really cool here. So I'm going to create a new project in a CBM PRG Studio. You can target all these different 8-bit systems, kind of cool. It also has, uh, uh, you can create a Git repo, which I'm not going to do right now. All right, so it gives you this nice little project explorer, which I'll talk a bit more going forward. But for right now, I want to take that program I was just showing you, which was Thief. And so you can import a basic file into this solution. I'm going to browse over here. 
I'm going to uh, find that D64 image of my very first floppy disk that we're just looking at. And there's a list of PRG files that it found in that D64 that I can import into the solution. So I'm going to import that thief. And there it is. Now you'll see something kind of funny here, right? When I was showing it to you in uh, Duramaster, this was Petsky. And you actually saw Petsky now. That is one of the kind of uh, things to know about this is this editor is not displaying Petsky, it's uh, ASCII. So there are two different kind of standards for what you can display those. There's a BAS text, which kind of puts these codes like that and knows how to deal with them. Seems really confusing because probably when you used to do that and you would do a program like that thief program I was showing you, you would probably start, and that's how I remember starting off. I went and just started drawing on the screen with uh, pesky characters off the keyboard. And then I went back and put uh, a 60 print quote, and then I'd go all the way to the end. And you know, that's how you, I used to do that. Um, but I'll show you a little bit about how there's a screen designer in this, in this tool that will help you do this so you don't get kind of, uh, uh, you can get away from having to draw on the keyboard like that if you want to. But that was one of the first things I struggled with. Anyway, let's go back to this program. So I've got an emulator already associated with this project. So from the, the code here that I just imported from that disk image, I'm going to and go ahead and uh, build it and run it in the emulator. And there is the same program we were just looking at, rebuilt through here. All right, that was the quick tour. So let's uh, get into the real details. All right, first of all, I showed you that Durmaster tool. It's actually been around for a long time. It was actually from 2006. Um, it's freeware. Uh, it does a lot of cool stuff. And it also supports, has a dizzying array of Commodore uh, archive formats for disks and tapes and all sorts of things like that. This tool has support for all of them. Um, and they also have, if you go to their site, they also have some cool things, like they actually do have a Petsky true type font. Um, kind of creates problems when you're trying to do with the Petsky characters, but it looks pretty cool if you want to try that out. All right, so the rest of the stuff we talked about is um, the CBM PRG Studio. Arthur Jordison. Um, it's been around for a while too, since 2011. It's also free, but it's not open source. It's also built on the Microsoft.NET framework, so if you want to run that on something that's not a Windows PC, you're going to have to do a few tricks. It is possible, though. If you want to put something on a Linux box, you can actually use a, a version to get that to work. There's a couple of videos on YouTube that will help you if you want to do that. And um, like I showed you, it has a whole lot of support for almost every one of the 8-bit machines. I'm going to do a bunch of Commodore 64 stuff today, but you can do all sorts of things. Um, and in the beta version that I'm using, you might have also seen that uh, the Mega 65 is also starting to sneak in there. So uh, it's pretty cool. All right, so why would you want to use this uh, tool? This is just like the high level of all the features. Um, there's all these editors and tools that help you with sprites and screens. Uh, if you're into uh, doing a lot of SID music, there's a tool for doing that. Um, I, uh, uh, there are other things, like if you look at, um, I know there's VS Code, there are some plugins that people use and they try to edit Commodore code and VS Code. It's kind of got some problems. Um, there's some competing products out there like uh, C64 Studio. Uh, but really, if you want everything, it's all integrated very cleanly together and uh, works very seamlessly together, uh, CBM PRG Studio is the way to go. So let's go in and do some more stuff with it. So let's talk about things you can do in the code editor. Um, like I said, the auto numbering, almost every uh, modern IDE doesn't have a programming language that uses line numbers, so this is kind of a, a unique feature that you actually can have auto line numbers. A lot of the other things are pretty common and things that you would expect that a modern IDE would do with the uh, syntax coloring, uh, block indents, uh, autocomplete, things like that. So I think, let's see if we can go and I'll uh, do some sample programs and we'll do this together to see how it looks. 
All right, let's close this project. And I'm going to create a new project for the C64. And let's just call this edit. All right, so I'm going to create an add a new basic file here. And let's just start off with something simple. Right, clear the screen. I'll talk a little bit about why I'm not using the, uh, the special pet ski characters for that, and I'll show you how that does work it. But for now, let's just do it that way. And, uh, all right, something simple there. And then let's just do something where I'm gonna print some characters across the screen. Is that a font size big enough? I feel like I need to go larger. It might be hard for everybody to see. Well, all right. Since we're here and we're talking about all the options and things, let's make the font size a little bit better. Let's go to, uh, let's go to 28. See if that's a little more fun. All right, cool. All right, so I'm just going to make a simple loop there and then uh, print the, uh, the character. You can see I got like, it gave me my open and closing brackets there for, my, for this uh, statement, pretty handy. All right, so that's a pretty simple start program to start with. So let's just, uh, let's just take a quick look at it in the uh, emulator and uh, see what we got. All right, so yeah, there it is. Um, exactly what you'd expect. But let's do something else cooler with it and see why you'd actually want to do this. You could just type this into any emulator. You don't need a CBM PRG Studio to do that. But let's talk about some other stuff. All right. Um, I want to add some uh, more code here. I want to change some stuff. So I'll, let's take this block here. And I still want to keep this, but I don't want it at line 30. I want to move this down a little further. So there is a renumbering tool here. This renumbering tool will take either all the code, if you have nothing highlighted, or if you have a selection like this, it'll ask you, um, just remember that section. And where I want to start at, and what the increment I want to use. So I'm going to say, yeah, let's start at line 100, and let's use increment of 10. And then it renumbers that little section of code for me. So I've got some room to insert something else here. So let's insert something else here. First of all, um, white space. Man, um, all that Commodore code is like so hard to follow because it's all like smashed together, isn't it? Uh, this editor, except for trying to be aggressively auto numbering for me, allows me to put all this white space so I can keep track of things. Pretty handy. All right, so let's, uh, now that I moved that block down to start around line 100, um, let's put something else here. Let's uh, uh, put another print there. And yeah, yeah, let's do it this way. All right. Yep, and then we'll just do a, you know, a real simple thing here to wait for a key press. <laughs> All right, that worked out pretty well. Now, um, so I kind of got like three segments to this program at the moment. I've kind of got the, uh, you know, the beginning piece here, then I've got like this press any key to continue, then I've got some stuff here where I'm printing out some characters. So a lot of uh, modern editors allow you to create regions, and so we can do that. So let's take these two lines here that I've created and they can go into for a selection and I can say the term he uses is fold. So if I fold that up now it collapses that and allows me to move that around and get that out of my way if I need to have a piece of common code. And there's also I've got that line 5 there where I've got a basic remark statement. Yeah that works out okay. But there's also these uh, editor only remarks. So I'm going to do this one to, uh, you know. So when you use this exclamation in the dash, that's going to give you a comment that you see in this code. 
But when you actually compile this down or put it into the emulator, it's going to remove that stuff, right? It's going to remove all that white space. The emulator doesn't know anything about white space. It's going to remove that region statement, right? The emulator has no idea what a region statement is. So the pre-compiler cleans up all these things that are nice for us to have in the editor before it gets over into the emulator. All right, let's try something else here. Um, all right, I talked about comments. I got a listing only comment. And I can also do block comments. I used to, be, I used to love doing these back in the day. But so um, there's a real simple way to do that where I can go into, um, let's see, where am I going? Yeah, a comment block. So I can go into edit, uh, comment block, it pops up a little thing here, ask me what my boundary character wants to be. And I'll say, you know, um, and let's put some text here, print some characters. And it will insert a nice little block comment for me. Kind of cool. All right. Um, I think we can do something better with this, too. So let's try something else. Uh, so I want to insert a new line here. When I hit enter, it's going to give me automatically auto numbering. It figures out that I'm in between my increment, but it knows I probably want to have like line 105 here. So it gives me that automatically. Pretty handy. And let's do, yeah. Nothing really fancy here, but uh, this will make it slightly more interesting. All right. And there we go. Um, so now I've got this bit of code that's inside a loop. And, you know, visually you kind of want to see that. And other programming languages actually make you indent that. Well, you can do that too. So I'll take this selection of these two lines here and there's an indent and outdent, and it will actually move that around. This is also kind of a listing only mechanic, so uh, it shows you that visually, but when it gets ready to put this code down onto the emulator, it's gonna strip out that extra indent, but it sure makes it easy to read, doesn't it? Uh, all right, let's, uh, you know, I wanted, oh, I, I wanna show you some more of the stuff here. All right, uh, I got this print statement here, so. For clearing the screen above, I'm using this character string 147. But there's a screen code builder tool that will help you figure out and actually insert the old ones. So uh, if you go into the tools and the screen code builder, it gives you a keyboard here and it can uh, you can actually use that layout or you could use a little key map here or there's also some like really frequently used key codes here. So I want to make this uh, white. So it has a little builder here. If I string multiples of these together, it will allow me to do that. And when I hit update, it takes the insertion point I had back in the editor and adds that code in there. All right. Um, and I think just for to be uh, a good citizen of my code, I'm going to add an end statement here. All right. Let's take a look at this in the editor and see from what you see here, what it actually looks like. And hopefully if I got all this right, it actually runs. So let's go see. All right, got the white text. Did that, cool. Now the listing you see is very compact because all the other stuff got stripped out. Pretty cool. All right, I got one more feature I want to show you in the code editor. Then we're going to move on to some of the other tools. So this region I created, uh, this could easily be something that you could consider a subroutine that you want to call in multiple places. So I've got this wonderful thing where I've got a set in the solution files where I can actually have multiple basic files and other things. So let's create another basic file. I'm going to call this one subs. And in the subs, I want to take this code that just does a simple print out that message and wait for a key press. Copy that, I wanna paste it over here. All right, so I also know that um, where I want this to go, I, uh, I don't want it to be line 50. So I'm gonna use that renumber tool again. Go up here, tools, renumber. Uh, let's start it at, yeah. Why not? Let's call it 500. Let's start at line 500. 
and you can see that uh, it will not only renumber these, but it also got that reference that I was using. That, that used to be line 60, and it will automatically readdress the, the, the new numbers. Very cool. All right, I'm kind of making this a subroutine. Let's actually, you know, return that. Okay. And then if I go back over here, let's delete that code, and I want to say, you know, line 35 here, go sub 500. All right, cool. So uh, what I'm actually showing here is that if you can, you have multiple basic files, you can create as many of these as you want to. You do have to be cautious of the numbering because the precompiler is basically going to smash all these together. And uh, if you have situations where you have conflicting line numbers, it's going to have a bad time. But otherwise, it gives you a nice way you can actually, you know, pull things out like you would like a modern programming language. So let's see if we actually do this actually work properly. So uh, let's go do this project and run it. Yeah, so there it is. It take, took the content of my two files in the project, uh, smushed them together, cleaned them up, and there we go. All right. Uh, that's pretty much the cool parts of the code editor. There's a lot more, but that's the highlights. But I want to move on and talk about something else. The screen editor. I don't know if you use any other thing, any other uh, modern IDEs that have screen editors. Um, and there's also some standalone tools you can use for Commodore, which are kind of cool. But let's talk about the screen editor that's integrated here. All right. Let's go back into demo mode again. And I'm going to create a new simple, let's see, close this project. Create a new project here, Commodore 64. Yeah, we'll call this one screen. Okay, so I don't have any basic files yet, but I'm going to create a screen design. Same thing, right click on it, say add a new file. I'm going to just give it an S. And this is the screen editor tool. So I've got a, basically a draw area here. It's got some lines and guides to kind of keep me like centered on where I want to work on the screen. And I can select the mode. I'm going to use a draw mode right now. And uh, I want to use, you know, this character here. And then you just basically click, drag and drop. And you can draw. And you can draw kind of messily there. If I use the right mouse button, I can get rid of that stuff. Yeah. So I'm just going to leave it kind of messy here just for fun. Why not? All right, and let's take some other characters. It's, uh, you know, I want to put some, I guess I'll call it grass. I'm going to change the color here to be a green color. And I want to use the reversed version. So I'm going to use the reverse space. So it gives me a, a color I can draw with there. All right, nothing too crazy. All right, um, there's also a mode here where instead of drawing with characters like I'm doing now, I can say I want to draw with lines. So if uh, it does this pretty decent job of interpreting, so if I drag uh, a line, tries to draw it across the boxes there. If I want to use actual boxes, it can give me pet ski characters that try to draw the boxes. Kind of cool. Um, there's also a text mode here if I want to insert some text on top of this. Let's put some, let's put some white text. I'm going to guess, let's try. And about right here. And I'm going to say uh, press any key to continue. And oh, wait, I'll do that uppercase. Hang on. We need to get rid of this stuff. It actually takes me, it took me a while to get used to this, the fact here that uh, the uppercase is not the default in a lot of these things. So there's settings that will like force those uppercase characters on top of it. 
But all right, so let's go to text. Let's try this again. I'm going to say forced uppercase. There we go. All right, so now I've got the screen design, but what do I do with it, right? What do I do with it? Well, what I want to do with it is I want to get it into code. I want to get it back into my project and actually display it. So I'll save that screen design. And now under the options here, I can export this as a graphic or I can export it as a basic program. So that's what I want to do. I'll say export to basic. And it wants me where do I want to start my line numbers at. Uh, let's start at like, yeah, 250. Um, what do you want to do? Increments of, yeah, one. And this creates all the code that I need to actually display the screen. I'm going to copy this to the clipboard here. Close that. Close my screen design. I'll go back to my basic file. And let's uh, add a new file here. And I'll paste all that code in there. So this is all the code that actually displays that screen that I just designed. And just so it stays on the screen for us, let's add that little uh, Alright, there we go. So, let's uh, run that and uh, be amazed when we actually get the that screen in the emulator. And there it is. Now you also notice there's a bug here, right? Because the uh, the top box of my uh, the top line of my boxes is as a amp ampersand. And it didn't turn out to be the line. I, I do a lot of copy and pasting when I try to do that, but uh, that's the general thing there, right there. You can also see it's also a little more like the uh, actual pesky there. All right, so that's the screen design, but. Let me show you another way you can apply this. And I want to show you another old program that I wrote. So let's close this. So another program I wrote uh, that's on that first disk is this program called uh, Quest hanging around here. There it is. You can see that I did the same thing where I'm like drawing with some pesky characters to kind of make a maze. And then it goes over to you know another maze when some things happen. So uh, let's do something here where I take that and I'll uh, create a new project. All right, and I want to import that from the disk image, the same uh, way we're doing the other things for. Uh, yeah, let's do this one basic file. All right, so there's the there's the uh, the version of that with all the pesky characters and stuff like that. And now the line numbers are all weird here because I did this a long time ago. So the first thing I'm going to do, let's just renumber this whole thing. So without doing a selection, if I do the renumber routine, it just lets me do it from wherever I want to. So I'm going to say start at line 100, increment me every 100, and uh, there it goes, it just renumbers everything. So I know that the code that did this old map is in this line number between uh, right here, just like 300 to 1300. All right, but so let's get rid of that. So there's an easy way to do that. All I gotta do is go in here. Uh, first, I'm gonna put into a, a region, like I showed you before. So now I know what I, that's the region I wanna deal with. Now. Let's get rid of it all by commenting it all out. So there's a nice little um, comment. And now like all those lines are now commented out for me. Cool way I can work with that. OK, so now um, I actually have that screen uh, to kind of make the presentation go a little faster. I already pulled it in. So if I go into, say, uh, I'm going to add an existing screen design file. And I, uh, I extracted it out here. Uh, there we go. So this is the little maze that you saw in that code listing before. And uh, now that I'm here, um, you know, the, the, the program basically looks for these uh, checkerboard. And if it's a checkerboard, it knows it's a wall, so it won't run into it. And I can change this up really quick and really easy. So if I add some more checkerboards here, and uh, I can extend this maze. And let's see, yeah, let's clean up a couple things there. And uh, yeah, so 
you know, not being that fancy here, but you can see the, the gist of it here. So now, if I take this, uh, now that I've extended the maze a little bit, and I'm going to export that to basic again. And let's start at line number, because I knew where this was about. Let's start at like, yeah, line 250 with uh, uh, increments of one. So that's my new maze. Copy that to the clipboard. And I know I want to insert it about right here. I'm just going to copy and paste that in. And there we go. So now if I run this project, you can see there that I just took that old code from 1984 and without much work, put that into the screen designer, uh, changed the, the whole thing up, but the program still works because it's based on I'm just looking for those checkerboards and knowing those are walls, so it won't let me bounce onto them. So. There you go, that's the screen designer. All right, sprites, oh my goodness. You know, when I was in biology class, I think that was the first time I really had graph paper. And I remember I was supposed to be doing something with like genetics of pea pods or something, but instead I was actually charting off uh, sprites. I remember charting off and like doing all the calculations to, to uh, you know, design sprites. Oh, this tool, uh, so much easier. And I'm going to show you a couple cool things about it. First of all, I don't know. Does everybody recognize where that little, that sprite came from? It's a very famous sprite, right? That's like the, from the programmer's reference guide, the balloon sprite. All right. So we're going to hit on a couple of another cool features here while we look at this. So I'm going to create a new project. Let's call it uh, balloon. I'm gonna call it that. Okay, so um, there are sample files. Almost every piece of code that was from the programmer's reference guide or from the user manual exists in this tool. They're under the sample programs. There's both basic programs and assembly programs. So that balloon program is here. I can. Uh, generate it right there, and that's the code for that old balloon program. Don't believe me? I don't know. Let's take a look at it and see if that's really what I want. Oh, wait, before I do that, we need to see the sprites a little bit better. Because um, remember, the, 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 the version that as is is really hard to see because it used to the, si the sprite is in cyan, and it's like really small. Uh, so let's make it a little bigger. 29, all right, let's make it... Uh, larger and then also let's make it white so we can see it instead of the that default cyan color right all right let's run it and see if this is really did i mess up something is that it all right cool yeah live demo there you go Anyway, there is the sprite that we all saw. Okay, so now, how do I use the sprite editor in this situation? You're probably wondering. All right, so let's take a, create a new sprite in the editor here. Um, and the sprite editor uh, has this awesome feature where I can import from a listing. So it knows that I've got this basic listing behind me and you can either say, if I'm looking for a specific sprite, I know where it's at. You can say, start at, you know, such and such line number. I can tell it, like, there's how many sprites there are in this data. Maybe there's four sprites there. Or I'm going to say, find the sprite data. which is going to, like, just comb through my whole listing here and look for a sprite. And it finds that data and decodes it and puts it into the editor here for me. Pretty cool. So now I can start changing it. Uh, yeah, so... Let's not, let's get rid of the Commodore logo. Why don't we do that? And let's see if I can draw a semi-decent, uh, 
I don't know, there's a VC and an F here. Yeah, that's okay. All right, so the uh, the scratch pad here, um, not only can I now take the sprite and I've got all these things here, if I'm trying to do an animation, then what if I wanted to take it and then like the next one I want to shift the pixel up or down and you can manipulate the sprite data right here. I can also do the opposite if I want to like go to the left, go to the right. So that makes it really easy if you have a set of sprites you're trying to put together. Now you also have a scratch pad. If I have multiple sprites loaded and I've kind of manipulated those to create an animation, I can drag those together and uh, kind of see what they look like to, you know, I only got one here right now so it doesn't show much, but that's what you can use a scratch pad for. All right, so I've changed the sprite. So uh, what are we gonna do about it? Let's uh, export to a listing. And yeah, you can do some things here for how you want it to uh, represent it. Let's see, save that. All right, so I've got uh, two sets of data here, right? Kind of messed this up in some ways, so let's clean this up. But first of all, this was the old sprite data I don't want anymore. So I'll take that handily. I will uh, comment that old data out. And my line numbers are all messed up here because I didn't change my defaults. So let's uh, manipulate that and get that. Oh, I took too much. Ooh, it put it right in the middle of that, didn't it? All right. Now I want it to be below that. All right, so I got my sprite data where I want it down at the end of the program. That's commented out. Now I just need to recreate the stuff that I uh, blew up when I came out here first through this. Uh, oh, you know what? I need that too. You know, I'm gonna have to. I, I might have to redo this. I don't know if I can get this back. Let's see. Poke. I want this 1,000 to go elsewhere. All right. Let's see if I can figure this out. So that part's right, that part's right, and I want to recopy this because I've lost a number there, I think. All right? Well, that, that was that one? You know what? So I don't like end up fat fingering this. Let's just go back. Um, let's see, let's make sure my insertion point is where I want it, first of all. And uh, open the re export this back to a listing. All right, looks like I might have got that right. That was a line number that, that 1000 came from, huh? All right, so if I uh, did this right and didn't totally destroy it, we'll actually see the uh, instead of the Commodore logo, we should see the VCF balloon now, right? Yeah, there it is. How simple was that? I think it's very powerful that you can import the sprite data from a listing and then start manipulating things. One of the coolest things I like about this. All right, moving right along. All right. I bet there's some people in the audience that are really looking forward to this portion, right? Oh, man. All right, so um, I'm not going to go into a lot of this. There's a... He, Arthur seemed to have rebuilt some of these tools, so it's sort of like a, well, there's a lot of familiarity with a lot of the other assembly language and flavors. Um, it's sort of unique to him a little bit. Now, the version four that he's working on, he's actually adopting the kick assembler, so that's actually gaining more support, I think, in the community and becoming more used. But uh, there's some nuances to this, so I'm just gonna do something really simple. I think we should be able to all understand it, and uh, I'll show you some cool things here, how this works. All right, so as we do with all of these, let's close down this last project and uh, create a new one. All right, so I don't have uh, uh, to worry so much about uh, my typing skills. I'm actually going to uh, pull in something I already had ready. Okay, so this is a this is a quite simple. It's just going to print out um, some ASCII alphabet characters and. Uh, I'm starting it, you know, at a specific spot here. But when I run this, 
something maybe unexpected is going to happen at the first time when you think about this. So let's see, build this project. Uh, yeah, let's build it to a file and run it. Ah, there we go. All right, it didn't do anything. But the reason it didn't do anything, I know this one actually. All right, because it started off in the basic loader and I actually want it to like you know, go to there. So this is the whole point what I wanted to show you was that uh, one of the easy ways to get started with this now is after I have a project here and I'll say I'm loading this into a specific spot in memory and it's just sitting there when the basic loader just starts. Um, Arthur added a nice little piece here so I can go into uh, the tools here and I can uh, generate that syscall that I had to do manually there you know, put a nice little loader for you. So I'm actually mapping up to the, the same spot here so it knows where to start. And it puts this little bit of a loader here. So now that I've got the loader that it automatically generated for me, which is you know a trivial piece of code, but sometimes a, a, a hurdle for people to get into. Uh, let's go back and uh, let's see, let's clean that project again. Build it to a file. Yep, that worked. And let's run it. Now, this time, instead of just coming up there and doing nothing, it actually executes the assembly program that I wanted by, from that little basic loader. Cool. Okay, well, I think we're doing uh, pretty well. We've went through about everything. Just a couple, I guess, last thoughts. Um, I said I didn't show the Git integration, uh, but we talked about the sprite editor. There's a really cool character editor that's a piece of this. If you want to start making, uh, you know, the same thing as the screen designer and the sprite editor, it has a lot of good support for uh, custom characters. Uh, we did the screen code builder. There's a really good memory viewer, and uh, of course, the assembler and disassembler. If you're uh, doing a lot of that, it's really well integrated into Vice, and you can get uh, very handy. Uh, I talked about almost all the other like uh, code formatting tools. Um, there's also basic constants. I think there's a lot of uh, common conventions, like I was using the, for the sprite data when I was using V to represent the, the SID address. There's a uh, baked in constants that do a lot of that for you if you really get into it. Um, and of course the MDI interface. We kind of showed that a little bit, but that's it. So I guess, what do you, what do, you do next? Um, I really suggest you go try downloading it. Um, it's easy to find, it's easy to install. As you've seen, it's pretty easy to get started and using it. Um, there's a really good help file. They've put together an amazing help file. So if you get stuck, you can go to the help file and there's probably something that will get you along your way. Um, there's also a lot of really good videos out there. There's a lot of fans of this tool and you can find a lot of videos and tutorials that are available. And uh, really, just try to go back and uh, experiment and enjoy when you used to be able to program on your old Commodore 64, but now you can do it on a Windows PC and with all the conveniences of a modern IDE. So that's about all I had for today. Thanks for struggling with me and getting through all the live demo pieces. And uh, anybody have questions? Anything I can help out with? Oh, oh, I see what you mean. He's talking about, uh, I talked about for the, the people who made the Durmaster also have the Petsky TrueType font. And so if I were to use that as my default font, would it work? You know, I've not tried that. Um, I'm kind of curious because I'm not really sure where they mapped the, the, the rest of the font that has all the, the rest of the, the, the drawing characters into the true font type font. I don't know if it'd work. In theory, it would. I don't have it installed on this laptop, but uh, in the font option, you can choose what you're using. So in, I would, I would tend to say it wouldn't work, but it'd be curious to try. I don't know the answer though, uh, because I, I do want to show is that when the uh, I told you that there were two different ways that uh, it represents the uh, what do you call it the uh, where am I losing it? At? There we go. It's a TOC64 or the Bass Text. Those are the two options that it uses to convert. Petsky into one of those two formats now, and then it knows how to convert those back when you compile a program. So I, that's why it makes me think that it'd probably run afoul of that bit 
and it wouldn't actually use the real one. That is something that's kind of cool. If I mentioned the C64 Studio, which is one of the kind of I don't know, competitors, if this is a competition um, of uh, this tool. And he actually took the time and he built all the Petski in there and he built an editor that shows Petski. So it feels a lot more like you're using an old 64. Um, I doesn't have as many of the, 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 the code editing tools in it, but it does have like the, the more old school feel if you want to try that out. So that's something that C64 Studio does have. Thanks for the question. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, I'll be around the show, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here and can stay for some of the other talks. All right. Thank you.